good afternoon uh, or good evening, uh, wherever you may be. If you are in Hong Kong or Taiwan or somewhere else uh, in East Asia, uh, we wish you good morning. Uh, my name is Larry Diamond uh, with uh, Dr. Glenn Tiffert. Uh, I lead the program on China's global sharp power uh, here at the Hoover Institution, where I'm privileged to be a senior fellow. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome you uh, to this special event on the end of uh, the system of one country, two systems, uh, and the challenge uh, to freedom uh, for Hong Kong. I think most of you know that on June 30th, the People's Republic of China effectively brought to an end what remained of its promise of one country, two systems, that it had pledged as part of the agreement with Britain that had its sovereignty back to mainland China on July 1st, 1997. With its imposition of a draconian national security law that the people of Hong Kong had courageously resisted in mass demonstrations of unprecedented scale that inspired the world, the Communist Party state betrayed its commitment to Britain, the people of Hong Kong and the world and launched an ongoing crackdown that has now ravaged the limited elements of democracy and rule of law in Hong Kong that gave those people and the world hope for a better and freer future for Hong Kong. This is now a new and more alarming era in the struggle of the Hong Kong people for freedom, dignity, and autonomy, and a major challenge uh, for American foreign policy uh, and for uh, the democracies of Asia Pacific region in particular, in terms of what is to be done. We are so pleased and grateful to have two leading scholars and activists uh, to help us understand the challenges ahead for Hong Kong and the world in this special session today. Our first speaker will be Victoria Tinbor Wei, Associate Professor of Political Science and a fellow of the Liu Institute for Asia and Asian Studies at the University of Notre, Notre Dame. Her essay, Crackdown, Hong Kong Faces Tiananmen 2.0, was published in the October 2020 issue of the Journal of Democracy. And her writings have also appeared in numerous academic journals and in the journal Foreign Affairs. Our second speaker will be Nathan Law. And Nathan, thank you for staying up very late in London to be with us. Nathan is a democracy activist and was one of the student leaders of the 2014 Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong that launched a new era of democracy struggle in Hong Kong. In 2016, he became the youngest person ever elected to Hong Kong's Legislative Council but his election was nullified under pressure from Beijing the following year. And we'll be hearing from our speakers about the tragedy that has befallen this most important instrument of uh, democracy in Hong Kong in recent weeks. Nathan recently obtained an MA degree in East Asian studies from Yale University and recently spoke on behalf of the Hong Kong pro-democracy pro movement uh, when it received the 2020 Freedom Award by uh, Freedom House. In his remarks uh, to Freedom House, he warned about China's growing sharp and soft power, aiming to penetrate and compromise the world's democracies and said, freedom for me is about having eternal vigilance toward the injustice in society and to be able to combat it freely. The people of Hong Kong are still combating it, but the freely part of that vision is now increasingly at existential risk. 
So uh, with that, we turn now to our first speaker, Victoria. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. The sign is good, right? Okay. So uh, Mary, the topic for us is that the end of Hong Kong and the future of freedoms. So let me begin with the, the end of the one country, two systems model. So for everyone from Hong Kong or for the rest of the world, the one country, two systems model as promised by the 1984 sino British Joint Declaration and the 1990 basic law, uh, Hong Kong's mini constitution, they basically, that's really the end of it. But there are two different interpretations of it. For Hong Kong people in the rest of the world, or when Britain signed the, the sino British Joint Declaration, the two systems refer to the Hong Kong systems with, uh, with the Hong Kong system, unfettered freedoms, free press, academic freedom, that you can actually go down with the isn't that Chinese leader. You can continue to hold candlelight vigil every year on June 4th. Whereas for Chinese leaders already at the time that they felt, well, you know, Hong Kong has so Hong Kong has capitalism, whereas China has socialism. So for them, the ideal was to take Hong Kong's capitalism, but without its freedom. So essentially what, what we're seeing is that China the system without has taken over the Hong Kong model of freedom, originally intended to protect Hong Kong from China's one party dictatorship. And how do we understand the end of this one country to systems model? It's sometimes because a lot of um, international observers probably pay more attention to Eastern Europe than to, to China or Hong Kong. And one thing to think about it is Berlin. And these days, for example, Hong Kongers have adopted the idea that we are all Berliners because think about a once free Berlin being taken over by the Soviet Union. The one, one difference is that Berlin was not really an international financial center without the significance of Hong Kong, the significance to the world. And two, another difference is that um, the PR did not really roll out the tanks to, to take over Hong Kong but we will be mistaken to just focus on the use of military force. So looking at, for example, the Hoover Institute's project on China's sharp power is that you really can dominate other people, you can dominate other countries without ever rolling out the tanks. And this is also what, what, the, what the authorities in Beijing and Hong Kong have done. Instead of rolling out tanks to the streets of Hong Kong, they subverted, corrupted the Hong Kong police. The Hong Kong police used to be Asia's finest. I remember when I was a kid that we actually would call these police uncle, police auntie, we trusted them. I still remember that many years ago when we were holding, when we were having protests, we would say high five to police officers. We didn't fear them. But then another thing is that these days that what has happened is uh, with, with the anti-extradition protests of last year, Beijing has imposed a whole of society crackdown. What I mean by this is that the crackdown has expanded from the core protesters to the rest of the society. When it came to the core protesters, there was, there's been this campaign to arrest as many as possible. So uh, since June last year, over 10,000 people have been arrested. Along with that is also a decapacitation campaign against protesters. So in the US, people have been just really appalled by scenes of police officers kneeling on the bones of uh, people, whether they are just, you know, they're genuine, genuine criminals or they are just protesters or they just happen to be unlucky. This kind of scene was very common in Hong Kong. And all, then we could actually see all of those scenes through live streaming media. And the police apparently did not even care. They were doing all of that in front of the media. Apparently, they knew that they did not really have to account for anything that they did. They knew that the authorities were behind them. Then another a part of this is that, um, for example, New York Times last year had a story. Behind every protest, there was an army of supporters. So this is how we came. How Beijing is also launching this whole society crackdown is that there were all that there were a lot of uh, middle class professionals. So not just the core protesters but many people who didn't really go to protest sites. We're talking about professionals, Cafe Pacific staff, uh, labor union workers, civil servants, even financial sector workers. They all separately 
organize their unions and organize their support they place they try to collect money to place as and how do you deal with these people if they don't get arrested uh, at protest site you try to still come up with excuses to dismiss them to arrest them but the minimum thing is that you dismiss them so that they lose their livelihood that's the best way to silence a lot of these people and then beyond that also a lot of prominent political figures have been subject to arrest. And these political figures actually have been very, very moderate. They, many of them, basically you, you were not, a lot of the core protesters actually find them way too moderate. So we're talking about Martin Lee who was arrested on April 18th along with many others. And, and they were charged with unlawful assemblies because in Hong Kong, if you want to have a protest, you have to apply for a no objection permit from the police. When the police stop granting such permit, then you are subject to unlawful assemblies. And they are, they are actually subject to five years of imprisonment for just partic participating in protest. And then also that this year for, for June 4th, that um, it was the, the protest was also not granted permit. And so more people were arrested for that. Now we expand also to the circle, also LegCo, the Legislative Council of Hong Kong. Larry was just talking about this, that uh, for a while, that basically for a long time, Beijing has managed to already keep the opposition in perpetual minority. But apparently, this, my, this even in the minority, but this vocal opposition is too vocal for even Beijing's taste. And then this year, early this year in, in July, in late July, Beijing first, uh, the authorities first disqualified four candidates. And then the next day, they postponed the elections altogether. This is because at this time, a lot of the opposition forces got together to organize primaries to make sure that they would not compete against each other. And there's this campaign to win 35 plus one seat because there's 70 seats with, with LegCo. So if you can win 35 plus one, you can control the majority. And because of that, because of this, this prospect that they actually could win, Beijing then canceled the elections. So not just that these people are, not, are now disqualified. So uh, last week, that's four of them because the, the elections were canceled and therefore that some of those continue to stay on. But last week, four of them got disqualified again. And then the rest of the pro-democracy legislators also walked out in solidarity. Now, beyond dismissal, another thing is that these legislators are so, also subject to further arrest. These four, for example, um, there's already talk that they should be charged with misconduct in public office. And we know that uh, 12, uh, 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 11 legislators, former legislators are already arrested for scuffles in the legislative chamber that happened early in May and, and June. So um, Larry mentioned the national security law. I would say that this has imposed a reign of terror. It criminalizes secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion. It is important to see that the definition of these clauses are so broad to include not just action. Uh, action could mean and violent and nonviolent. And terrorism actually also includes just setting up roadblocks. And also the law would also criminalize activity, meaning any kind of financial material support. It also criminalizes speech. So the next day people held a protest slogan, five demands, not one less, or ref revolution about time, look with Hong Kong. These protest slogans are now all banned under the national security law. And so far there have been Oh, about uh, 30 arrests under the national security law. Most of those that we actually don't even know what the charges are because the law is so big. Um, and, and then for example, Nathan's colleague, friend, and this child, uh, she's been arrested and we really don't know what exactly that she's going to be charged for. I guess in comparative perspective in the wider perspective is how do we understand Hong Kong's, the, the end of Hong Kong's freedom? I would say that, you know, I, I think it's important for us to see that Hong Kong's pro protests did not just begin last year, 
it actually has been going on for, third, for over three decades, beginning from the late 1980s. And then when we look at other cases in the world, whenever you see about 3.5% of the population coming out to protest, then a lot all of those cases actually uniformly succeeded. So in Hong Kong, we have seen up to 2 million people out of a population of 7.4 coming out to protest. We're talking about 22% of the population showing up. Then why is it that in Hong Kong, the movement has failed? I think because the idea, as I mentioned before, the idea of one country, two systems basically had two interpretations. And that's why it basically, essentially it was born, it, was, it just suffered from a bad birth already. And then in another important issue is that for a lot of these movements, they succeeded. It actually has then in a way created, uh, for Beijing has learned lessons. Oh, make sure that we do not even allow nonviolent forms of protest because nonviolence is like color revolution, which also means regime change. And that makes them think of tenement. So with all of these, so it is essentially, it doesn't matter whether it is violent or nonviolence that Hong Kong's protest is kind of like, it's really difficult to get anywhere. Now, where does this take us about the future? Uh, in a way that's all the legislators, when they stepped down last week, they said, you see you in the streets. The worrying thing is that you really can not see people in the streets anymore because the police will not issue no objection permit. Any kind of open dissent is now criminalized. But I don't think that you know Hong Kong has no future and no hope because the civil society is very strong. I would say it is very important for people to continue to maintain this very strong civil society, maintain the sense of community. And then another thing is to stick to the truth because the regime is really also learning from the tenement model to reconstruct the truth and to say that you know this is all about riots and the police are just restoring law and order and also impose amnesia. So we're talking about the, um, the, the governments trying to impose patriotic education on Hong Kong. And then another important thing is going back to what we said earlier that for Beijing, the model, the ideal model for Hong Kong is capitalism without freedom. And the international community has to really get Beijing to understand that it cannot really keep its cap capitalism or to reap all the benefits from Hong Kong without its freedom as well. So let me stop here. Victoria, thank you so much. And I really urge uh, all of our audience to read your eloquent and incisive piece in the Journal of Democracy. Uh, I will say, uh, I think we need to uh, have a conversation about what capitalism without freedom means because uh, in the rest of China, it's a very distorted version of uh, what we really understand to be capitalism. But we'll leave that for later. I want to give the floor now uh, to my friend and someone I, I very deeply admire, uh, both of you, but now to Nathan Law. Um, hi, everyone. This is Nathan. Uh, thank you for the invitation from the Hoover Institute and the introduction from Nery also the statement from Victoria. The title of this event is The End of One Country, Two Systems and the Future of Freedom in Hong Kong. I think the first part accurately depicts the situation and the later part remains uncertain. As we all are aware, the Hong Kong we used to know is gone now. After a year of protests and dreadful responses from the authority, the popularity of Hong Kong government has dropped to historical low and the confidence of Hong Kong people towards one country, two system ruling framework has basically vanished. While the situation looks grim in Hong Kong, the Beijing authority made it worse by circumventing all of our consultation and legislative processes to impose the notorious national security law to us as a de facto final nail in the coffin of one country, two system. With the draconian national security law, Beijing has an arbitrary power to detain, arrest, and prosecute any political activists or dissidents that they don't like. Carrie Lam says that the law is only intended to target violent protesters. This is a blatant lie. The sole re purpose of the law is to quash our freedom of expression, any desires for political changes, and the right 
to protest. It has created a widespread psychological terror and fear across the city. Up until now, as Victoria has mentioned, around 30 people have been arrested under the law. Indeed, international media had covered the arrest of my dearest friends, fellow activist Anna Shao, and democratic veteran Jimmy Lai, who runs pro-democracy news outlets in Hong Kong. High-profile activists like them were arrested as a retaliation towards the sanctionings from the US government towards Hong Kong officials who are responsible for the human rights violation in Hong Kong. However, arrests are not limited to those of the highest profiles. Ordinary youngsters have also been arrested simply for possessing flags and stickers with protest slogans on during arbitrary stop and searches in the city. These cases demonstrate the use of the law to terrorize and deprive Hong Kong people on all levels from the most fundamental rights and as a legal weapon from the Beijing government. By setting up these examples and abusing such a vaguely defined law, a sense of fear and white terror has permeated our entire city. Some of my friends are actively disengaging from political life and deleting posts on Facebook due to the fear of being prosecuted under the national security law. Academics are self-censoring uh, and eliminating research topics that may be considered as crossing the line. Reporters are worried that they are no longer able to cover certain sensitive topics. The latest update are the outcasts of the pro-democracy legislators in the council. Four legislators were ousted by the Beijing government due to the retrospective application of the concepts in the national security law. Subsequently, all the other pro-democracy legislators resigned to protest, resulting to a chamber that has no genuine opposition voice. Some may find the action hard to, uh, to understand, but for many Hong Kong people, this is the way to preserve their dignity and unity as it's impossible to speak up in the council anymore when the government can arbitrarily unseat them. But the suppression does not stop at Hong Kong. Recent reports have also indicated that signs of academics and students in Western institutions engaging in self-censorship, either for the fear of danger when they visit China or due to strong funding ties to CCP-linked donors. Hong Kong is simply the first domino of the free world that has been knocked over by this autocratic influence. Hong Kong was once praised as a pearl of, of the Orient, and the vitality of our beloved city radiated through its freedom-loving traditions and citizens that are hopeful in their future and the system, but the shrine of the city has faded. Our generation has grieved and witnessed the complete degradation of our home from the beacon of freedom in Asia to an authoritarian police state that we no longer recognize. Today, thousands of political dissidents have already been arrested. Hundreds of them are imprisoned and even tortured just because of their love for the city and the desire to protect them, even at the cost of their life and the future. I myself am one of them, I had been elected as the youngest lawmaker in history, but was eventually evoked from the council because of Beijing's intervention in our local legal system. I was jailed because of my participation in the peaceful civil disobedience movement. And for now, I had to flee to London to embark on a life in exile because of the threats under the national security law. According to the news outlet delivered by the state media recently, I am now wanted by the Hong Kong police force for my pro-democracy activism. I'm still living in the fear of being hunted by the Chinese government and their far-reaching secret services, which have a long reputation of kidnapping and covert missions. It's devastating that I am unable to go back to my beloved city, but I left for a reason, not only for my safety, but the liberty to continue to speak up for Hong Kong people and I think many youth in Hong Kong 
share the same sentiment with me, which even though the reality seems grim, but at the bottom of our hearts, we still have hope. Also, arise from the shared experience and suffering in the movement, a much stronger sense of Hong Kong identity is fortified and it will fill the future struggle for our autonomy. Many are concerned with the future of Hong Kong because they think that the Chinese Communist Party is too big to fall. Indeed, the CCP is still very powerful and equipped it with the most sophisticated tools to quash dissidents and survey its people. But we can also see a much more consolidated international responses to the human rights violation in China. Most of the EU countries uplift their extradition treaties with Hong Kong and many of them extended the arms embargo to Hong Kong and released strong and prompt statements in regards to all the major incidents happened for the past few months. The CCP, of course, has their own problems to face. China's economic growth has long been regarded as a source of legitimacy and stability, but the pandemic has dealt it a blow with a looming debt crisis, an even recovery, growing income gaps, failing industrial transformation, rising unemployment rates, and pressure drawn from an aging society, its growth model and wealth redistribution system failed to generate sufficient economic power to keep the country going on the current path. The wolf warrior diplomacy adopted by Xi Jinping is an example of, of, this, chi of this shift trying to drum up nationalistic pride to replace decreasing confidence in the party. Yet, it will also steam international criticism and isolation on the global stage. When China is more isolated, its economy will be worsened. This vicious cycle would lead to a potential gigantic legitimacy crisis. Still, the short-term future for Hong Kong is still looming. There's no signs of Beijing deviating its heavy-handed approaches and the civic society in Hong Kong will face suppressions just like the ones in mainland China. Sectors like education, judiciary, academia, journalism are the major battlefield. The government will try their best to avoid any accountability and silence the crowd who dare to speak. These intrusions will be more subtle, quiet, but as detrimental as the ways they prosecute political activists. As now we have left the Beijing dominated chamber, it's not easy to guide a new path that can generate momentum to fight back. But luckily, even though the suppression is an arch, the tenacity and creativity in the resistance movement are also emboldened. We have a stronger economic circle that reciprocates the movement, we have larger international lobbying network that helps build up our tactics and policies that hold China to account. Our voices are more visible and determined than before, which helps us to garner more support from the international stage. The road of combating authoritarianism is lengthy and pumpy. I hope more institutions in the West could join us in the fight. The democracies need to join our hands and work together to safeguard the liberal values and stop China from spreading its ideology and control over their brothers. We hope that the democratic communities around the world can stand together and to protect our shared democratic values. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Nathan, and thank you, uh, Victoria, for your incredibly uh, eloquent uh, and moving uh, and informative remarks. Um, I want to get into uh, the question of what exactly uh, we can do to help you, we individuals, but we in the West uh, more broadly. Um, before I do, I'd like you to illuminate a little bit more what's happening on the ground in the following respects that uh, enlarge your concept of uh, battlegrounds, uh, Nathan. First of all, um, 
if you can tell us about the state of those arrested and what lies ahead, it sounds like uh, there have been tens of thousands of arrests, um, but there are hundreds of people now in jail. Um, do we, first of all, know who those people are and who's monitoring the conditions of their treatment? And second of all, for the others um, that have been arrested and are awaiting trial, what is the legal process and timetable that awaits them? And my second question- Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll ask both of these questions and Nathan, you can start and then we'll come to Victoria. Uh, I, I wonder if you could um, enlighten our audience a little bit more about the state of the mass media, which we know uh, is slowly being strangled uh, in subtle ways as well as overt ways by Beijing, uh, with of course uh, Jimmy Lai's Apple Daily being a brave holdout, and the state of civil society organizations. So Nathan, you start and then we'll come to Victoria. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Larry, for the inter in interruption previously. Oh. And um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll answer the first question. Um, there are more than 10,000 arrests for the, in, the past, in the past year. And a uh, few hundreds of them are facing serious charges like rioting, which could result up to six to seven years of sentencing. And uh, most of them are awaiting trial, but uh, already several hundreds of them are being locked and uh, waiting trial without bail. So that is the situation of Hong Kong's uh, political dissidents, which is actually drastically different from a couple of years ago uh, when I was sentenced to eight months uh, in 2017. It was already seen as one of the largest political cases in Hong Kong's history. But for now, we are saying that these people, these fellows, they will face years of imprisonment. And many of them, of them will face that. And there are many of them have already given the sentence. So the, this is uh, what we are uh, dealing with. And for, for these people, we've got out their information because uh, the court cases are open uh, for publics to view. And um, there are uh, people, mainly the district councillors, uh, that they will pay visit to them. And there is some fundings that uh, can help them for their, uh, uh, for example, uh, daily charges in, 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 in prison and supporting their families. And we're trying to build up a backend network that could help them to alleviate, uh, alleviate their pressure. So in general, I think uh, there are good monitoring system in place, but we don't know whether in the future, the, the government would um, close down, would cram down the, the fundings and cram down the physics uh, from the district councillors. Uh, this is uh, the development that we pay close attention to. Is there a website that people can go to to contribute if they want to support these, uh, uh, the legal uh, defense of these people? Yes, there, there are a few uh, particular foundations that provide support to these people. The most famous and most credible one is uh, 612 uh, Humanitarian Assistant Foundation, which is uh, monitored uh, by uh, famous singer Dennis Ho and other former legislators. Uh, you could check it out um, on their website. And to, if you could, uh, you're generous enough, you can make a donation. Great, so we'll ask you to share uh, those with us and we'll put them on our website. Uh, Victoria? Yes, thank, thank you. I, let me just add to what Nathan said about the condition of those arrested. So earlier I said that, you know, over 10,000 arrested, but actually there are also many thousands who were injured during those protests because some of them managed to just get away even though they were injured. But, um, and, and then at the same time, those who were detained, it was actually until last year, it was never unheard of. So for example, when Nathan, was you know participating in, in the umbrella movement. He was expecting that he could be jailed, but then I don't think that Nathan would ever expect to be beaten, to be tortured, or, or to be denied access to lawyers and family for hours on end. And these are all happening in Hong Kong since last year. So that's another thing that is also very important to keep in mind. 
And then back to the question about the state of the lead mass. So the media, the press, a strong reporting network behind the protesters, because without uh, the press, we would not have known what was going on on the ground in Hong Kong. And what is interesting is that last year, I mentioned earlier that the police would torture people right in front of live streaming international local media. But after you know they got what they wanted, they provoked outrage and so also provoked the violence turn. Later on, it's like, we don't really want that. So what has happened in the last few months is that one, um, we used to have the Hong Kong Journalist Association just giving journalists accreditation on their own. And the police decided to take that away. And now, unless you work for one of those pro-regime media organizations, you would not be allowed uh, uh, on site. Well, you can still go, but then whenever the police decided to show up and then they draw the call, yellow code in line and you happen to be inside, then you'll just be treated not as a press, but as just another protester and you're subject to arrest. Another important issue, Earlier, I talked about how Beijing is also trying to learn from the Tiananmen playbook to impose its reconstruction of the truth. One of the major incidents last year was in Yunlong when white shirted thugs attacked people. And with that incident, which came called its government media organization, they ran two very, very good programs to sort out who was doing what, essentially providing evidence of collusion between police officers and these white shirted thugs. And for that, it, the producer was arrested. And so a lot of the things are going on and the media at, at the forefront. Another group to look at also is uh, medical workers because a lot of us really did not know what happened inside hospitals, but the extent of these injuries. But last year we managed to know that because medical workers beginning in mid August, they were protesting with the sign, Hong Kong police attempts to murder Hong Kong citizens. They actually are the people who know the kind of injuries. Um, and not the first question, what can we do? One thing is that support, you know, if you are a US voter, support all of the legislations that are currently on table with the Congress, also lobby the incoming go government. At the same time, it is important to also put pressure. You tell, you know, if you have the right to vote, tell the people that you want to you, you want to govern the United States, that you care about Hong Kong. Ask them to actually take strong action, not just to, to make strong words. And Nathan earlier talked about forming an international coalition of democracies to champion values because Hong Kong stands for universal values. I think it is just as important because ultimately China has this sharp power and it can coerce other countries and individuals to, to ex exercise self-censorship because of its economic power. And so I, I'm really hoping that who, you know, the, inc the, the incoming government administration is going to restart the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. Now that with China already signing, getting all the, a lot of the Pacific countries to, to join the RISAP, the region, its own China-centric organization that occupies about 30% of the global trade. The only way to counter that is for the US to rejoin the TPP, which then was, was much broader. And is the one, it would be the only organization that excludes China. And back to what Larry said about capitalism without freedom. China, the main difference between now and Berlin was that at the time the Soviet Union did not really count on Western democracies, Western economies. Today, China's own economic model actually relies on its access to global capital, global market. And so that's really the, the leverage that the international community has. Well, you've begun to answer uh, the question uh, that one of our um, participants posed. I'm gonna read it anyway, just because it's touching. I grew up in Hong Kong in the 1980s. I'm a dual citizen of the US and UK. My heart is broken for my beloved city how can we help the people of Hong Kong from abroad uh, beyond just praying and, and posting on social media? So you've said uh, to begin with, well, uh, if you live in a democracy, whether it's the United States or Britain or Australia or whatever, uh, let your Congress uh, representative, let your member of parliament know that you care and uh, you want action. Now, uh, you've said you hope 
the next administration, uh, which I think will be the Biden administration, will stand up for human rights, rally a coalition of democracies to stand up for human uh, universal values in, in Hong Kong and uh, obviously in Xinjiang and in, in China itself and around the world, we have an instrument uh, which you're both deeply familiar with and lobbied for, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act that uh, imposes sanctions against uh, uh, officials from uh, the People's Republic of China, from mainland China, and from the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, who are deemed to have been responsible for human rights abuses in Hong Kong. Um, I would uh, like to ask you each um, to evaluate what the United States has done so far to implement the provisions of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, what would you like them to see them do that they haven't done, and whether you see any other democracies moving in the direction of that legislation? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question, Larry. Um, I think, uh, first of all, it, it reminds me about uh, what I felt differently when I visit uh, DC for the first time in 2015 when uh, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act was first drafted and proposed in the, con in the Congress. Uh, the numbers of congressmen endorsing that were less than 10. But we can see that uh, last year's passage of the law, of the bill, it was uh, uh, a bipartisan agreement and there was one acting vote and the others voted yes for that. So we could, really see the huge difference between the issue of Hong Kong and the, the, the popularity and the, the degree of attention of the uh, uh, US politics paying on that issue. And I think the major change would definitely be uh, how the US position China, uh, it, the US China policies had, had been through drastic changes in the recent two, uh, two to three years. And we could all really witness that through the ways uh, Chinese, uh, the U.S. government um, portraying China, processing it as a threat instead of a strategic cooperation, and uh, we we can see from a lot of speeches from that. So I think uh, that general trend is uh, moving to a right track. But of course, uh, if you uh, want to say that, um, is there anything that we need to do more in the future? Yes, indeed. I think we need more cooperation. We we need more multilateral approach uh, in alliance with uh, democracies in European, uh, in Europe and also in Asia so that we can have a much larger coalition and occupying more um, economic power to combat that authoritarian uh, expansion from China. So I think in the future, a cooperation would be definitely uh, 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 a crucial factor to, to how we enhance uh, that kind of um, China strategy uh, in the global stage. Yeah, so you guys essentially, I agree with uh, Nathan. What the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act does, you know, ultimately is to require the administration to certify if Hong Kong remains autonom autonomous to, in order to keep its special economic privileges to be treated as a separate customs uh, uh, zone, uh, separate from the rest of China. So it was really important that um, the State Department announced early on that you know Hong Kong basically no longer has autonomy. Well, the actions actually so far, um, we actually there could be a lot more done. At the same time, I think what happens is that Beijing really did the calculation is that one, they don't really care what the rest of the world does because they are becoming the next superpower and they bet on the fact that you know all these other economies count on China's investment, China's uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, the China's market. And then at the same time, they also calculated that, well, if the US actually does anything to take away everything from Hong Kong, then it is actually a lose-lose situation for US businesses as well. They probably bet on the fact that U.S. businesses will continue to lobby against taking stronger actions. 
I think one thing we can think about is that for so long, that Beijing was trying to take advantage of Hong Kong's special economic status to get access to international capital, international finance, international technologies, and all of that. But now that you have all of these major international companies with their regional headquarters in Hong Kong, they have their own assets, they have their entire buildings. So now, the, essentially, the, what the national security law also asks these companies to do is that if we ask you to provide information, to provide data on your employees, or you know, if it is Facebook re request that you provide data, you have to. We actually don't really know what has happened. Uh, immediately, Facebook and WhatsApp and all of those companies got together and said that we are suspending any processing of such request. But since then, we actually don't know if they go back to comply. So maybe Beijing is actually taking leverage of the existence of these internet, international assets to make it very difficult for the US to take stronger actions. And then this goes back to also what I was trying to say earlier that ultimately China's, a lot of its power, even its military power is a function of its economic power. And so then the, really the most effective way to start to, to counter China's influence is to go back at the roots of its economic power from this coalition. And another thing is that the U.S. has done is to impose sanctions on 11 individuals, high officials. Well, you know, maybe if, but if Carrie Lam, her assets, her family actually are in London and not in the U.S. So those sanctions actually don't mean anything, which also goes back to it's the importance of getting all of the, the Western democracies to come together to impose sanctions at the same time. And on top of top officials, it may be just as important to also impose sanctions on police officers, which is something that a lot of politicians or governments don't really have appetite for, because ultimately you want these guys before they shoot and, and beat up people to think twice. So one thing is that you have wants to have leverage on top leaders. At the same time, it is just an importance that maybe we can count on the foot soldiers, the people who have to carry out orders to, to pause and think twice. Uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, call now on my uh, colleague, our program manager for the China Global Sharp Power Program, uh, research fellow, uh, Glenn Tifford. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, we've spoken about the media, but in addition to the media, three civil society institutions that have distinguished Hong Kong from the rest of the PRC are its education sector, particularly its excellent universities and the judiciary and the bar. Beyond the well-known cases of Benny Tai and Johannes Chan, I wonder if you could both reflect on how far the worsening climate that you've described in your remarks have affected these institutions recently. Uh, thanks for the question, Glenn. Um, there are several uh, incidents that we could refer to. Uh, the first one is um, there are already universities having flat raising ceremony. Um, in, in upcoming days. It, this is a big thing for them because there, there has never been uh, any flag raising ceremony in these universities, but um, they are starting to have one. So it really shows that they are having, th that there's a need for them to show their loyalty to the government. And uh, secondly, uh, all, all these universities, they are, uh, school council are being controlled by uh, the, by the uh, chief executive, um, the members of it most of the members were appointed by the chief executive. So basically they have uh, the power to determine uh, all the issues in uh, the school and they are already professors. They are very worrying about um, their position in the university as they are more or less more outspoken and working on more or less uh, sensitive issue. So I think uh, for now that um, we indeed need more response from the West in order to really help these uh, rather vocal um, professors and also um, to preserve their academic freedom in Hong Kong. And that has been a proposal that I've been advocating for, which is uh, not directly uh, applicable for, uh, by the help of uh, individual scholars and, and universities. But I really do hope that all these uh, uh, university ranking system, they could include uh, a, a rating of academic freedom as uh, one of the factors when they rank uh, these universities. And uh, it will give incentive for these universities to, uh, to have more leverage when they need to counter some very observed orders from the governments. 
and it will help uh, those professors in the universities to fight that for their courses because they could use it as the name of preserving the ranking of the university, which sound less political, but it will help them to negotiate in their field. So I think if we could really add that factors and helping these uh, professors, I, I think it will be a good thing. Uh, so I, I guess um, we are facing a very difficult time, but we will have a lot of uh, struggles in the process of that. Yeah, to add to that, oh, go ahead. To, to add, so to add to that is that the education sector and the legal sector are very, very important. Um, so it's just yesterday, uh, Zhang Xiaoming, the uh, uh, first uh, vice deputy director of the Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office, in celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Basic Law, he said that you know the Basic Law promises Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong with under one country two systems model. He said that actually we really only want patriots, only only patriotic Hong Kong people are entitled to ruling Hong Kong, which means you know essentially only people who are loyal to Beijing. And so this has then been extended to the education sector and the legal, the, the legal sector as well. And um, I think the, wor the, the worst thing that's going to happen is that people, they may, the authorities may introduce quote unquote legal reform to make sure that only loyal judges can, um, can stay. And already that's the national security law requires that the chief executive can appoint certain judges to rule over national security cases. And this may be extended to other things. We also know that judges who have um, uh, dismissed cases about certain cases because the police are lying or they don't have sufficient evidence. And those judges have been subject to massive attacks by people. This is another thing to keep in mind. And at the same time, back to kind of like, how do we counter a whole society, the crackdown? And also what Larry said, what can we do? I think other professions in the rest of the, of the world, one thing that people could do is to have this peer-to-peer -peer connection. Uh, I suppose as a professor, then you know, professors should really reach out to professors in Hong Kong. Uh, un labor union work leaders in the US should reach out to labor unions in Hong Kong. The legal sector, the bar associations in the US should reach out to to the legal sector in Hong Kong. And in that sense, then that's also will create a bit more kind of like, you know, at least whatever happens, we know this is going on, even if you cannot really stop what Beijing really wants to do. Great, uh, thank you. I'm going to uh, pose several questions now uh, that have been posed uh, by the audience. Uh, and then I'll, uh, let you each uh, answer the ones you can, and I'll have one final question I want to ask you each that I'll save. So why don't you uh, take some notes and answer as you can, and Victoria will come to you first this time, because the first question is right up your alley. Um, does nonviolent protest work? Okay. I know you've thought a lot about nonviolent civil resistance and have written widely about it. Uh, some people think, well, look what's happened now. Nonviolent civil resistance has failed. Would violent resistance be any more successful? I have a very strong view on this, but we want to hear your view and Nathan's. <clears throat> a colleague in the law school here asks more broadly, about you know, what the outlook is now for maintaining a robust civil society, which is of course the pillar of strategic nonviolence. And then there's a specific question that's uh, very interesting. I haven't thought enough about this. Um, the previous uh, Roman Catholic Cardinal uh, in Hong Kong, Joseph Zen, now emeritus, was, as you know, an outspoken critic of the CCP, but the current archbishop has been, uh, the questioner uh, postulates, uh, far friendlier to the Beijing authorities. And um, the current pope, of course, this um, is true for mainland China as well as Hong Kong, has been criticized for reaching an accommodation with the Chinese Communist Party. So. Comment, if you will, uh, each of you, if you wish, on the role of the Catholic Church and religion uh, more strongly. 
And then finally, my colleague, our director of FSI and senior fellow at Hoover, Mike McFall, our former ambassador to Russia, uh, and I and others have been very uh, concerned about the increasing weaponization of Interpol uh, by uh, authoritarian regimes like China and Russia. Do you see the PRC trying to utilize Interpol uh, to try and further put the squeeze on Hong Kong protesters? And of course, we would, being with your being abroad, Nathan, we would uh, worry about your safety in this circumstance. Victoria, let's start with you and then we'll come to Nathan. Okay, great. First question, um, on July 1st last year, hundreds of protesters stormed into the Legislative Council building and one of the graffitis that they spray painted uh, around the building was, it is you, Carrie Lam, who taught us that peaceful protests do not work. In a way that they have a logic because Hong Kong's democracy movement has been going on for over three decades. And every time it was nonviolent, every time it was peaceful. And also the umbrella movement was strictly nonviolent. It was peaceful, but then it didn't really achieve anything. So we can understand why people came to this conclusion. But at the same time, it is important to know that when nonviolence has not worked, is actually to work. Time, it is important. We have to look at not just how repressive the regime is, um, but also the level of state's capacity. So for this, I'm taking from Tilly Taro, uh, Tilly Taro, because they argue that it's, you know, maybe you, you, if you're dealing with a weak regime, because a weak regime cannot really monitor every inch of its territory, it cannot really surveil uh, every single one of its citizens, then maybe you have a chance to do anything, to do something. But we're dealing with a regime that has the highest capacity around the world. They can actually put everyone under surveillance. This is something that we haven't talked about, is that all the prominent, all the known opposition leaders in Hong Kong are under 24-7 surveillance. Whatever they do, that the authorities know. And given this, any kind, any turn to violence is suicidal. Just basically no way to work. Now, does it mean that nonviolence doesn't work? That's another thing that um, protesters, when they spray painted this, they misunderstood nonviolence to mean only peaceful protest. There are many means of nonviolence. It's not just about going out in, in this huge, massive rally. Hong Kong people believe in strength in numbers. So they often count you know, how many people show up, but it is also important. And especially when you're dealing with a high capacity regime is that you take decentralized and diversified methods. The economic boycotts, the yellow economic circle that pro-democracy people support each other, employers support each other, and, and, and employees support each other, or people go basically make sure that you can keep the pro-democracy individuals sustainable over time. That is a decentralized, diversified, and also a daily method that you can do. You can actually pay a bit more to go to this little shop around the street corner that charges you, you more, but at the same time, you know that you know you are doing a good cause. So nonviolence has not really utterly failed in the sense that we haven't tried everything. And two, now given with the national security law, violence basically is suicidal. There's nothing nothing that we could do other than sticking to diversified, decentralized, and daily methods of nonviolence. The second question about the civil society, I am optimistic that the civil society, especially given what happened last year when all the different professional groups became so organized and the Hong Kong identity has become so strong that it can survive. Now, we also, you know, it's not just us who learn from the rest of the world. Beijing has done the same thing. They also learned that if the way to kill a civil society is to divide and rule. And they set up this hotline and get people to report on one another. And this can really kill the civil society. But I'm hopeful that Hong Kong people are really um, organized enough and committed enough and hate the regime, hate the authorities enough that they can resist this. And then the Vatican and, and Archbishop Sen, it's just in a way that a lot of people just really, a lot of Catholics really shake their head the way that uh, Sen has been treated in the Vatican and the Vatican has really turned toward Beijing. Uh, just one uh, a, a little story is that 
uh, when Notre Dame invited uh, um, Archbishop Sen to come, we roll out the red carpet. And I was like, I had never seen Sen, you know, other than putting on a t-shirt and all sweaty in the protest. But at Notre Dame, he looks so saintly. And so in a way that in the religion also can help people sustain the faith even in hard times. So I guess this is another thing we can look at. Yeah, I guess um, for now, uh, if, if we um, try to understand the Hong Kong movement and also possibly Thai, the, the, the Thai movement, we could really discern uh, the leaderless nature of that, uh, which also infer to there is no set of rules that we could follow. And um, there are lots of diversified uh, actions that would come out from the protesters. So that would definitely result to uh, exploration to different tactics, including nonviolent and violent ones. So I guess there has been a trial period or a period of testing of different tactics. And we were just realizing that uh, there will be a lot of uh, much more miserable consequences from the violent protests as we were seen just a year before from now on. So I guess uh, uh, this is a learning process of uh, the public because what we rely on on the leaderless movement is collective wisdom. And we have to been through a lot of history, been through a lot of experience so that we could generate enough consensus on certain um, mindset on certain conclusion. So uh, uh, I think uh, this is something that is difficult to be construed by uh, structural or theory that are under the notion of uh, leader, uh, under the notion of centralized leadership and uh, ordinary protesting. So I guess um, this is a, a more organic and dynamic one. And for the civic society, I think um, as what Victoria have said, uh, the, the hotline from uh, the government which encourages people to turn out the others uh, is solely its sole aim is to uh, destroy uh, the social fabrics, uh, the trust among each other. And my recommendation is you have to always to stay in a small group which you could fully trust each other and you discuss every, anything with them, with your political, uh, uh, political views and you fully trust them so that you still have some room to discuss things in your head and not to be worried about being turning out. Uh, I guess this will, uh, if this becomes a usual practice, it will encourage you and uh, making you not being defeated by the uh, government and by these uh, measures, even though the, uh, the government tries to get rich to you. Great. Um... I'm going to close uh, and ask you uh, each to uh, address um, uh, two final questions, very difficult ones. Uh, first of all, um, the question of economic sanctions. Uh, someone asked, well, should we encourage divestment from Hong Kong on the part of the West? Should we impose broad economic sanctions uh, for uh, Hong Kong's uh, uh, violation uh, of human rights on, on the economy and society rather than targeted sanctions on individuals. What are the trade-offs there, there that we should weigh since obviously we'll be hurting ordinary people if we do that. And then something that haunts me, uh, which is I, I think really a moral dilemma here. Um, I think Canada and Britain, and my view is probably the US too, should be prepared to accept, um, in my view, a virtually unlimited number of immigrants from Hong Kong. Uh, uh, you know, um, if they decide that the risks of continuing under this system are just unbearable. But of course, if everybody who hates the system leaves, uh, then, <laughs> you know, in a way the PRC is one in a different way. So there's kind of a tension between a humanitarian impulse to help every individual we can uh, who wants help or an exit and the kind of political impulse to affect change. Uh, Nathan, why don't you start and then we'll come to Victoria. 
close. Um, thanks, Larry, for the questions. I, I, I guess uh, the important point for the first questions uh, is about how we can avoid these trade relations being abused by China as a way to circumvent all the international obligation and responsibility that they should bear. So if, if uh, we can hold them accountable, it's fine, we still trade with them. But if they are always going to abuse these trade relations and take advantage from it, and uh, to continue its human rights violation, regardless of what the international community has said, that is problem and we should tackle it by divesting it. So I guess these are two complete different scenario. And uh, for me, of course, I, I would love to see when we have a stronger alliance, which could possibly uh, be a conglomeration of uh, many democracies and it will occupy more than half of the GPT, GDP of the world. And then by the time we have strong, we're strong uh, alliance and power, to have trade with China while holding them accountable. I guess this is uh, the more uh, desirable outcome um, than the previous one. So I guess uh, th this question is also related to how much leverage we can we have and uh, how much pressure that China will suffer when they try to abuse that uh, trade relations. And for the second questions about, um, well, uh, yeah, immigration. immigration, yes. Um, thanks for the re reminder. Uh, for me, I, I don't think that will be many people leaving, to be honest. Uh, it's is not easy to settle yourself in a new place as I've, I've been to, uh, I'm going through. And um, I guess there are also a lot of people trying to stay in Hong Kong to fight. And when you consider immigration, there are lots of other things that you have to really pay attention to. Uh, well, the job opportunity, the future, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, all these like lifeline scheme, the, the meanings of that is they're offering safe exit for the people who can leave and face imminent dangers. And that's why uh, I think actually the promises from the government uh, that um, they're not going to review or take your uh, criminal records because of protest into consideration. This is actually more important uh, than actually offering um, uh, 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 more easiest uh, or more easier exit because it could guarantee people who are under political uh, prosecution when they can leave, they still have exit to go, and the criminal records because of politi political prosecution will not be taken into account. So I guess um, there are different ways to help them and offering them a scheme to leave is one of them. Um, so talking about divestment, it so reminds me of apartheid era South Africa. And in fact, I think Hong Kong, the current Hong Kong is going to be as repressive, if not more so, than what um, Black Africans, South Africans experience. So in that sense, you know, maybe it is actually not a bad idea to talk about divestment. But as I said earlier, that I think the biggest challenge is uh, for a lot of international businesses, it's like a lose lose situation for them because they have so much invested in Hong Kong already. They own buildings. So if the Hong Kong economy is not still going well, you know, they lose a lot as well. Uh, Larry asked, what about, you know, any kind of international sanctions are going to hurt the people of Hong Kong as well? But then the interesting thing is that a lot of Hong Kong people have been calling for sanctions. And and I know that this is, I've been hearing from friends that mean that you know, things in Hong Kong, even food is getting much more expensive than before. So they definitely are suffering, but they feel that, you know, there's really no other way to put pressure on, on, on Beijing. So they're willing to go through that pain. When it comes to immigration, the more dilemma. What is interesting is that I think Hong Kong people were shocked when London announced that it was going to offer up to 3 million Hong Kong people a pathway to citizenship. Pathway meaning that anyone who has a, uh, a British national overseas passport and dependents, uh, which means that people who were born in Hong Kong before the handover of July 1st, 1997 is entitled to this. 
and you don't automatically get citizenship, but you can go there and you have five years to settle down by a job. And I think even Britain actually didn't really think that, you know, the whole three million people would go. The thing is that, as Nathan said, for a lot of people, it's really not viable to go. And I presume that the people who actually would do choose the path of exit are professionals, are English speaking professionals. This is why those people actually are welcome everywhere. Um, but also another thing is going back to my points that Beijing wants to reap all the benefits from Hong Kong's economic status, but at the same time, culling its freedom. I think these measures together, divestment, sanctions, and also giving Hong Kong people the exit option, all of these together, you know, if Beijing wants to turn Hong Kong into just another Chinese city, then keep it as a Chinese city and you do not really get all the special privileges. And at the same time, for those Hong Kong people who cannot bear this, give them a way out, that may be the, really the best solution in the short term before Beijing changes its mind. Thank you uh, both so much. Uh, I'd like to close uh, this session today with uh, two observations. Uh, first, I will declare my personal view. I think it's time uh, for the United States of America and other uh, democracies around the world uh, to impose uh, targeted sanctions on uh, a wide range of Hong Kong uh, leaders uh, who are responsible for this uh, uh, really uh, devastating assault on human rights, limited elements of democracy that existed in the rule of law in Hong Kong, beginning with Carrie Lam, uh, her government, and other legislators that, are, that remain in LegCo that are standing by and allowing this to happen. Um, at a minimum, these people uh, should uh, have their visas re revoked to come to the United States, should be denied future visas, uh, and should know that uh, their kids are not going to be able to come to the United States and Britain to study and enjoy life here uh, if this is what they're going to do to their own people. Uh, finally, I just want to offer a personal word. I, I have a very uh, acute uh, and poignant memory of standing on a uh, kind of uh, rooftop balcony uh, overlooking the city uh, with Martin Lee and uh, another LegCo uh, legislator a couple of years ago, the last time I was in Hong Kong. And I fear perhaps the last time I will be in Hong Kong for a very long time. Uh, and we could see what was coming. They could see what was coming. Uh, and I asked them, you know, a version of what I just asked you. Uh, wouldn't you like to emigrate? I mean, why sit around and wait to be arrested? And um, I'll just say uh, that they and an awful other, uh, lot of other people in Hong Kong, um, you know, have an awful lot of courage uh, to stick it out and fight for freedom, uh, even though they see what's coming. And that, of course, includes Jimmy Lai, uh, who spoke at the Hoover Institution uh, within the past year, I think just last fall. Well, uh, you both are really a great inspiration to us. Uh, you've really helped to educate us about one of the great human rights and democracy challenges of our time. Uh, Nathan, our hearts are with you and your fellow uh, activists uh, in Hong Kong, and I hope you will continue to uh, engage us and tell us what we can do uh, to be supportive of this struggle. To everyone who joined us, uh, thank you for doing so, and please continue to follow uh, the work of our program on China's global sharp power on our Hoover Institution website. Thank you all for uh, participating, and good evening. Mm -hmm.